lecture is really about strategies for education, learning, those kinds of things. And again, we really have some pretty good evidence now of what works with these guys. And uh, people have studied it and have replicated studies. The problem that we're having right now is getting funding for um, more of the educational um, research. And that, that really is a problem because um, we want to really drill down on specifics and we just don't get funding for that. It's just not as exciting as finding a cure, <laughs> unfortunately. So the funding goes more into other areas rather than sort of translational studies where it kind of links up science with um, methodology. What I'm going to try to do today is kind of work that neurobiological components so that you can really see what we've done in terms of the research to show what areas of the brain are affected by the lack of protein production and then we can go forward and match up strategies, environmental conditions that will support those neurobiological conditions. So if we start, we're going to look at sort of what this is going to look like. So again, trying to get the translation from scientists to clinicians, it's not easy. But we have a phenotype, as Jonathan described to you, and that's basically what we know from science um, about the gene and the impact that it has on the brain. That's been studied a lot. We have that information there. Um, we also uh, want to know, okay, how can we then take that information, structure the environment and the learning patterns so that it accounts for that phenotype in some way, maybe using the strengths to build the weaknesses, trying not to focus on the weaknesses as much. That's why we don't teach phonics for reading because the auditory sequential is not as developed as the visual um, memory. So again, we do it more in a visual sort of reading program. Uh, what are the needs based on this phenotype? It's important. So not only are we going to look at how can we kind of capture the strengths, but we also have to make uh, accountants for, uh, the, the, uh, no, what am I trying to say? We, we really have to be careful about not loading the environment in a way that's going to stress out those areas of weakness. And then how do we design those? How do we design those interventions that sort of scaffold the support that we need for them to be successful? So we're all familiar with this. Uh, we will go then from uh, the science related to the gene and the impact it has on the brain. Uh, I think that Jonathan, did, did, I really enjoyed his slides related to uh, how the protein, really the lack of protein affects the brain development does play a major role in terms of the pre- and postnatal brain development. Uh, we know that this protein is extremely important for learning and cognition, and it also regulates the other genes so, and, and proteins. So we really want to be careful about that. One of the things that I think I don't want you to hear from this lecture is, OK, they don't produce protein, so all lights out. We're not going to do anything about it. That's exactly. Um, the reason that I'm here, to be honest, because we see those glimmers, we see those things that they're good at, we see those things that should, they should not even be talking about, right? That they've picked up incidentally, or they bring it into a conversation, and you say, wait a minute, he's supposed to have a 40 IQ, I don't get this, you know what I mean? So we just don't even look at that. We, it's just kind of put it on the back burner. I know you have to have IQs, and you have to have some of those assessments for funding and those kinds of things, but basically just say that's what it's for, and the rest of it we're going to talk about in terms of, okay, what can we do to capitalize on those strengths that we know our boys and our girls have, our uh, adolescents and adults have. This is an interesting slide because it really does look at where that lack of protein kind of settles in in terms of the brain and exactly those areas that are affected most. And we, that's great to see this slide, but it's kind of like, okay, so what do you do about it, Dr. Braden? That's great. That's nice picture of the brain, whatever, and now I'm seeing these, these are areas that are um, affected by the lack of protein, but here's what, it, here's what it does. And this is really important because when we look at these individuals and we understand the struggle that they have learning and their ability to engage in learning, this is why. I mean, it's working against them all the time, right? So if you look at um, the, the dendrites that we we see in the first one, you can really see what goes on because those spine and spines and the density of those spines um, really does affect the neurotransmitters. 
And of course we know that when things are working properly, that sort of prunes itself and in the process. And so we don't have all these spikes and we don't have all these, these sort of weird things going on that affects the synapse and the neurotransmitters. And so again, just looking at that, that's kind of a scientific slide, but here's a better one. I mean, this is, um, someone shared this with me and I, was, I think it's just excellent because it really looks like uh, that spine in, in density increase there, that neurotransmitter is really having some problems getting activated. This is kind of what these guys are looking at. It's really a disaster, right, for them to try to make those connections and to try to get anything productive out of um, them at that point. So what we're hoping for, and what I'm hoping that I can share with you, is kind of looking at that, again, translation from what's kind of crazy about that organization and, and the ability to make those connections into something that looks better. And we know that with the proper accommodations and the strategies, we can make that a lot easier for them. So that's the whole process that we're going to be talking about today. We know that there is scientific evidence that supports the fact that the anxiety is big. It's a big deal and that's because those particular areas, that overabundance in that area of the amygdala is really going to cause them to be anxious and that's just the science, okay? We also know that there are um, places that kind of are weak and that then affects the short-term memory and then the attentional control. We know that, don't we? Because the kids are hyperactive, they don't focus, they don't concentrate at times. We see that in our boys and in our girls. We also know that that weakened frontal lobe does cause them to have some issues with hyperactivity and that ex executive functioning, which means execute a plan, right? Plan it out and execute it. Again, I, I mentioned this when I was in New Zealand uh, last week, uh, that some of the carriers tend to have the same problem with the executive functioning in that. I hear a lot of times, well, she's got a lot of projects going, but she never finishes them. Our basement is full of all these crafts, but we never... <laughs> I'm seeing you guys in the audience. It's funny. You're making those faces, and I, so I know. Again, that's what we need to have on that checklist, right? <laughs> but anyway, that's something that we see oftentimes, and even the girls um, kind of collecting or having good intentions and then not finishing it out. So that's the executive functioning weakness. So what do we do about this, right? So if we know that um, our guy or our any student that we have with Fragile X has a lot of anxiety, we can help out with that. I mean, we can really give them choices. That's a really nice way to combat the anxiety. So over here, okay, great, I have this situation where um, these are things he has to do, but during his break time, he can make a choice. So again, um, I don't care about that. That's perfect, it gives him a little bit of a choice. We do know, however, that sometimes when you're really anxious, it's hard to make a choice. Have you noticed that? Um, I've gone taking people out to, to dinner that have Fragile X in my group, and we have to review the menu way ahead of time, and they just have a mantra. They just memorize what they're gonna order because I did it the other way, and it took over an hour for one of my girls with Fragile X to make a decision about what she was gonna order. So again, I think just knowing that this is something that it's fine to have, choices, but if they stall out, you're going to make that choice for them. So you just kind of have to play that out sometimes. This is just another way to give them um, an, a, a way to kind of feel a sense of completion, have some buy-in. That calms down anxiety for sure. So we have this thing where here's your schedule and you can mark it off. They love doing that. So again, we have uh, a way to kind of help with that anxiety. Predictability, that's why we have visual schedules. So first we do this then we do that. Um, you can also see the schedule on the bottom is a schedule that we use in a home program. Again, you're going to be looking at, here's what I do first, um, here's what I do next, whatever. That predictability is calming. It really helps with anxiety. Those of you that are anxious, if you're, everything's where it's supposed to be and you're a little bit OCD, that calms you down. When things are just crazy and there's no order to anything, it's hard to relax in that sort of an environment. So again, just kind of put that on steroids and know that that's how your child probably reacts to that unpredictable environment, right? 
Then we know, um, okay, here's another one, just a visual schedule. Again, we use these at the school. Uh, one of the things that we like about this is, you know, if the day changes, you're gonna be able to fix that up and kind of change things around. Those that are printed out really don't work as well because we know the day changes a lot. In public school, oh my goodness, it's every morning something changes, it seems, or they have something different that's on the schedule. And because we try to have our kids integrated into um, the gen general ed classrooms, they're changing those things all the time, so that means our kid only goes in at a certain time and it's not part of his schedule and so it's a mess. So we like to do it that way. We also use the question mark, I've talked about this before, where it really does help the child understand if something's gonna change in the day. So I would recommend that you have this on your home schedule as well. And basically what it's about is we started out with figuring out that the, the check mark stand, or excuse me, the question mark stands for a change. Okay, and that's all they need to know. But in the daily schedule, I'm gonna put that at the same time. So I might put it right before lunch. So he's always gonna know for that week or the week after, there's a change right before lunch, okay? He doesn't have to worry so much about the time, but he wants to, then he wants to know what the change is gonna be. Then as we get that habituated, we can move that question mark all through the day, and he's gonna know there's a change in that schedule. Let's say it's a weekend, and you made a plan, and you were gonna go to grandma's, but you have to go to the market first, okay? That's a change. So we're gonna put that up there first and then grandma's picture so that he knows, okay, we've got a change. What is it? I flip up the question mark, it's going to the market. So again, it kind of just gives them a way to sort of figure that all out and stage it in their own mind so they're not afraid. And also, if you spring something like that on them, a lot of times it's very difficult for them to deal with, right? Because in their mind, they're going to grandma's. So, oh, we've got a change this morning. Let's look at this. I see a question mark, do you? They normally will say question mark, question marks in the schedule. And then they know and they're alerted to the fact that something's gonna change. Yep, there's a question mark. I guess there's a change in our schedule. Let's flip it up and see what it is. Oh, we have to go to the market first because grandma wants us to bring some whatever for, for dessert. Okay, so it's, it, it makes it a lot more palatable for them. It makes them um, understand and sort of desensitize the change. So it's not such a big deal. Again, how do we structure the environment so that we can account for this anxiety? Calming strategies. This is a really nice one because this is something that happens at lunch for a lot of students. Uh, anticipating the, the loudness in the, in the lunchroom, anticipating kind of the chaos, uh, really tough. So this particular guy, uh, knows that that's a hard time for him. So w he is able to do some activities before he goes into lunch. And he can choose one of these. And these basically are activities to help with his sensory overload. So it kind of brings him down a little bit before he goes into that environment. Now he can wear the headsets and he can go in and, and kind of sit in a place that's not quite in the middle with all the noises. But he also knows that I can do this before so he's going to do some heavy work and what he does is they have a wagon that they pull with all the kids lunch um, boxes in it if they eat cold lunch they call it instead of buying a hot lunch so um, he can pull that in which is really cool because it has to do and it's related to lunch and then during lunch he can wear headsets because that's going to kind of calm him down and he doesn't get so it doesn't get so noisy and then afterwards he's going to do his deep breathing exercises so he eats and then he comes into our classroom and that's what he does so that works out really well for him we did this with the ot kind of looking at what are calming activities for this kid because sometimes for your child it may be different than your child and we have to really use the consult of the ot to help with that so here's some of the calm down activities that we've used and um, Jonathan talked about Jennifer Epstein. Some of these um, have come from her as well. So this is kind of that calm down activity where you sit in the chair and your feet are on the floor and you fold your hands. They really like this. It's kind of interesting because I think they kind of like that dramatic stuff. So this kind of gives them this sort of um, something to play out. Uh, so you're taking the breaths, you're counting to 10, but you can also do the one we talked about earlier where you're gonna smell the, smell the flower and then you're gonna blow out the candle. And that's a nice way for them to understand what to do. Using vis visuals is really very helpful with this. So again, nice thing to do, very concrete, and you just practice that. And it's really, it's really great in the school program where I consult, 
Um, the kids are doing their deep breathing, and if, if the teacher says, you know, it looks like you're kind of losing it, you need to go into the green room, because we have little cubicles for instruction, go in there and let's get started on your breathing. And I walk in, and there's somebody in there doing that. It's just so cool, because instead of seeing all the behavioral chaos and screaming and biting hands and that kind of thing, they're actually doing something that remedies the problem for them. And it's a nice life skill for them to have. Again, just an idea of a visual that Jennifer shared with us around um, kind of calming down. So you go to the top, so they kind of get the idea of when you're yelling and screaming, this is that red face, and that's really what it looks like. And now you're going to go down the scale to see if you can kind of get yourself calm. And maybe during that process, you do some deep breathing, relaxation, and then you're going to feel happy. Just remember that when they're kind of over the top like this, verbal is just not going to work. So just cut it down completely. Do not just pretend like you don't talk anymore and use the visuals because we know that will only aggravate it more and it's only going to set the stage for them to get more anxious. So again, um, just use that as a calm down. Here's another one and we can do this at home as well. These are just called towers from the TEACH program in North Carolina. So it's a strategy that we often use with kids on the spectrum, but it works really well for the kids with Fragile X. So what you're going to do is you're going to, if they have an issue with attending and executive functioning, you just put a whole bunch of structure in that. So the first one is the per, whatever color that is, um, pink or red or whatever, and they're going to do that one first, okay? And they're going to get a penny for completing it. That's how we started out. So we get them in this kind of in this habit of doing this activity. In that drawer is a maintenance task. It's really important. You don't teach anything brand new and expect them to do it independently, right? But this is something that you could do even at home. So maybe it's something that you want them, I don't know, a few washcloths in there to fold. I don't know, something that you could have them doing, even a puzzle that they do at home. They can you know, have it all out in the drawer and then they put it together and put it back in the drawer and they go to the next one and so it goes. I always kind of circulate, do my drive-bys and try to reinforce with the penny as I see each drawer being completed. So that way they start to get independent. We start with one drawer. That's all you start with because you can't expect them to go from one to two to three. Then you build on that. So again, this is something that's going to help them be more structured. If they're very all over the board and hyperactive, this gives them a very specific task to do. We know they can do it so they don't get frustrated. And they get it done and they get reinforced with their token. Yes, yesterday, some of you, um, I gave you the token boards. A lot of times we will use a token board, sometimes we use the penny boards. Uh, the penny boards are kind of nice, they're of course commercially made, uh, and basically it teaches money. So there's five tasks and they earn a nickel, okay, and then you can kind of get it even to two nickels, we'll make a dime, so they have to stretch, so they have to have ten uh, correct responses before you can reinforce them, and so it goes. But anyway, um, yesterday I showed you some ways that you can make from their favorite cartoon characters or movie characters, just some icons, and then you put five together and you can um, have them earn something at the end. Usually it's a break. So this is a nice way to help with that short-term memory to keep them focused. This is another way to do that. This is a nice program that we have. One of the schools where I consult where the teacher puts out these tasks in the afternoon. This is at an elementary school. But it's really important that they're starting to learn how to work independently, right? Because this sets them up for some sort of a job later on. And even if they're going to do something else besides work in a, in a workshop or something, it's still a very good strategy to have them feel really successful at. So these are things like sorting. These are things like um, sometimes we'll have little bags, school bags, where um, the, it, it gives you the instructions. So in the red bag, you put two pencils, one eraser, and it just kind of has it that way. In the green bag, you put three pencil, pencils, two erasers. So again, they're either going by uh, pictures and then putting it into the bag, or if they read, they can actually read it. Check it off, so it's kind of a neat activity for them to do. They put it in the bag, and when they're finished, they raise their hand, and you can see if they've really followed the directions or not. So again, this is just one thing to add uh, to provide them with a lot more attentional control because it's very well organized. This is another one where again um, this guy can work through his tasks that are on the wall but he also needs his headsets most of the time and they're noise canceling so it works out just fine. 
What about hyperactivity and executive functioning? Again, we know that's an issue because we looked at all the science and came over to now the application and making it more practical. Well, a lot of times we need that sensory input. We just have to have that for the hyperactivity. They have to be able to move during the day. Got to let them move. They have to have jobs. They have to walk from one place to the next. Contrive an errand. Have them carry the, a, a basket of something with a ream of paper in it to the secretary in the office. That's fine. Heavy work. Makes sense. Really cool, right? And the secretary's on to it so that she knows, oh, thanks so much. Glad you were able to, you know, thank you so much for bringing it in. Goes back to the classroom. Just a nice thing when it's kind of getting goofy in there and you see them needing to wiggle and move. Um, it kind of gives them that opportunity to move their body, but also to be helpful. And don't they love that? They love special jobs. We oftentimes will have a vest that is, you know, he's the, he's the school helper or whatever it is. And so he puts the vest on. I mean, they don't forget to do that. Oh, you know what? I think you need to take something down to the office. Don't forget to put your vest on. Well, he's already got it on, right, before you can even say that. And he's down taking something to the office. That's his special job. So again, that gives him a chance to move. It's just kind of a clever way to put it into his day. He doesn't feel like he's different than anyone else, but he feels special because he has a great job. So this was Ways to Remedy. It's in your handouts. Just remember, this is a great way to take care of the executive functioning deficit, which is that getting started thing. You saw the rhythm. You saw the music. You might do the first step for them, just getting him started. They kind, she kind of did that. Uh, Fill-ins, remember we do that closure, so you do the backward chaining where they finish the, the last one, and then it's not so difficult to do a task. Um, your intonation patterns, as you saw her doing it, using an accent. I think I was really uh, mesmerizing some of the boys in New Zealand because of my accent. See, I didn't have to do too much, but they were really excited about that American accent. So anyway, um, just looking at the emotional responses, like I said before, remember that there is a re an emotional response to whatever we do in this environment and what we do with the kids. So that if we embarrass them, if we say something bad, if we do something like, um, you know, raise our voice or something, we're going to see some of these emotional reactions, right? We're going to see them not wanting to fail, not wanting to make mistakes, getting embarrassed, being kind of shy. Um, and then the hit, you saw him doing this kind of stuff. I mean, that's, that's what he was doing for a while. He had, we took, his data was, I'm, I'm trying to remember correctly, uh, when I first started helping them, this guy's in Texas, I'm pretty sure it was 800 times hitting his head, I believe in a 15 minute period. It was outrageous. It was bad, yeah. And some of the times he wanted to hit it on the ground, you know, when he'd come into the class. So we had mats everywhere because we didn't want him having concussions. Um, very, very anxious guy. He's on a lot of meds, but it's still, you know, it was just needing, you needed, like Jonathan said, you got to have the meds with the, the strategies. This is an interesting one because this guy has basically drawn, I'm sorry, note, right? But you can see even the sun has a frown. So he basically threw something at one of the caregivers and um, he felt really bad about it. So this was kind of his note to the caregiver to say, I'm sorry. Um, couldn't actually write a note that said, I'm sorry for doing X, Y, and Z, even though he's literate. Um, this just worked better for him to really tell us how he felt about it. So again, um, just to let you know, they have those feelings. I mean, he really did feel badly about that. The environment. That's the easiest thing to fix. So again, you want to make sure that you have a nice area for them to work. If you look over here, and again, this is just typical teachers, this is kind of crazy, right? It's going to be real hard to pay attention. And I understand teachers love their rooms to look really neat and cool. And they did this just for him, and they put up all the things he was interested in. He couldn't get a thing done. <laughs> I mean, the intention was right, but uh, kind of got him off on some other track because 
he wasn't going to pay attention to something as mundane as something at his desk here. He was, he was going to look at everything on the wall and check that all out. So again, just remembering that if you can make things as simple as possible, this is kind of a neat strategy where each kid has a token board depending on what they're working for. One of them can only work for five tokens. The other one can sustain the attention long enough to work for 10, post it on their table. That works kind of well. Um, another thing, uh, obviously, the visual timetables, the routines, the things we've talked about before, boundaries for work areas. I think when you set up your classroom or even at home, if you have an area that's sensory, let's have a boundary. I've even used the blue painting tape to go around so that they're sure that's where this happens. Let's say it's deep pressure time or wrestling time with dad. That goes on over there and only over there. That means that you can't jump on top of sister, you can't jump on top of mom and say, let's wrestle, because we're not back there in that corner. That is where that happens. Really an important thing, and they really pick up on this quickly. So again, just kind of making that happen. A lot of movement breaks for sure. Um, heavy work, we've talked about fidgets and sensory tools. Uh, those opportunities to assist and have a special job. Sometimes our pace is too slow, teachers, and if there's anybody in the audience that does any caring, um, we, we tend to kind of slow it down, and that we lose them, okay? So we need to keep that pace going. Uh, I think also just using those high interest materials and opportunities for them to be social with typical peers. That, that's another one that's really important. Okay, high interests, we can use things that are kind of exciting um, and get them engaged and then we can go forward um, to, to kind of bring in the, the new stuff. So it's kind of a bridge. So remember the cluttering, remember the visual lighting, remember some of that really does affect these guys. Using those supports, reduce the verbiage. Organize the space as well. Give them some charts so that they can really their, their behavior will model what their environment looks like. So here's a mess, <laughs> and here's a nice cleaned up mess, right? So how do you go from this kind of an environment, right? Which I can't imagine anybody has a room like that. I just pulled that off the internet. <laughs> Nobody in here. Um, and then this is something that kind of gives them some direction. Well, that's a little difficult if they're used to the chaos. Again, wonderful classroom, beautiful, but terrible for a kid with Fragile X. So again, just looking at, it's not about us, it's about them, and it's creating the environment in which they're comfortable. <coughs> there will be times when you can't change the environment, so we need some props, and sometimes it's going to be sunglasses. I tell the story about the guy that's still coming to me with therapy, full mutation. Um, who wears sunglasses all the time while we talk. It's okay with me because we're talking about things that are hard to talk about. Um, sometimes we use some of these chairs so that um, you can support the core because we know these guys have a really, really kind of uh, relaxed core. Their muscle tone is so low that it takes a lot to hold them up. That's why working half days is usually better for them. The cognitive research, we've seen this. You heard me earlier when I showed you the brain and some of the dendrites and what was going on with the, with the uh, protein. These are all this, the summaries of the cognitive research that then ties in the science with specific areas of functioning based on IQs. Um, so again, we know this. One of the things about that Jonathan said about the girls and, and even the boys, with the verbal scores being higher, we kind of do think and expect more of them because they're so verbal, right? So there's times where we think they're kind of faking us out or they're not trying, and they really are trying. So oftentimes they give you this sense of they're really, um, they can do something they can't because they're so highly verbal. I think the girls too, a lot of times, they'll kind of talk to you and tell you what you want to hear when in essence they really aren't in agreement, they're really not able to do something. That's why sometimes they'll agree to doing things, and then when it comes right down to it, they can't bring themselves to do it. They'll avoid, okay? So just remember that IQ does not decline over time. As Jonathan said, they just don't keep up with their peers, and so even though they're going forward, they're still gonna look like they're behind. They're still learning. That's the important part. Here's their style. It's in all your handouts. You guys know about this. Gestalt learners, meaning the whole first. They're simultaneous learners. 
Um, we can do the backward chaining. That helps a lot because they see the whole thing and then you just pull out the last step. Um, indirect instruction, we've talked about side dialoguing, all of those things. Um, strengths again, long-term memory, they do remember things that happened a long time ago, don't they? And something will trigger it and they'll give you every detail of things you totally forgot about. Um, associative learning, we, that's why we need context, put it in a context. Give it some storyline and then he will remember something or he will remember a word or he will learn something in context. Um, they do need things to be kind of figured out and closed up. They need focus um, in terms of helping them focus is, is a problem because of the weakness there. Deficits uh, in terms of processing, it's just slow for them. The executive functioning we've talked about, sensory dysregulation, etc. Oftentimes, I will have parents say, well, what do I do first? Shall I get speech? Shall I get OT? Shall I get whatever? And again, we can't say what comes first. I think most of us would say if we had a newly diagnosed child, we would be wanting to look at for sure the speech and language so that the behavior wouldn't have to be the vehicle by which they communicate. But again, gosh, you've got all kinds of things that you need to tick off here. And I think you just look at your child and say, what's hanging him up the most? What's getting in his way the most? And if it's behavior, because that usually comes out first, and that's why I get so many calls, I want to see the function of that behavior. He's not being bad to be bad. I want to know why he's acting the way he is. So I'm going to go back to the antecedent. I'm going to figure out what the trigger was. And I'm going to figure out, is it because he can't communicate what he needs? Probably. So now I'm going to put in more communication. I'm going to figure out ways for him to be able to tell me what he needs, rather than get angry at him because he hit me at that particular point, because he couldn't express himself. Again, what comes first? Here's all the different therapies. We can do social skills groups. We can do some writing. We can do um, work on, you know, filtering out things. We can help with the social stuff. This is a really neat study. We talked about this before many times. And that is basically looking at the engagement of elementary school-aged children with Fragile X and that knowing that it's strongly related to the environment and the instructional quality of the teacher in the classroom. That's what makes the difference, not their Fragile X status, whether they're full mutation, whatever, medication, or if they have a dual diagnosis. So teachers are really important in this process. If we teach the weaknesses, that's exactly what we're going to get. These are reading programs that I've used that I think are pretty effective. Um, I like essential sight words. I like read naturally down here, which reads to you. And then you read. Um, it's nonfiction, which a lot of our guys really like. Uh, there's an Osmo, which is another app for the iPad. But what's neat about it is it has a camera reader up here. And so you spell out a word and it tells you whether it's right or not. So it's not just a screen to have a screen. Um, there's a problem solving, there's um, some matrixes, there's lots of neat things that they do with that Osmo. This is the uh, Edmark reading and what it looks like. And again, my logo reading. And then this is the word builder right here that comes after the logo reading. And um, you should know that my app, the logo reading app, is $2.99 at the App Store. Uh, only okay for iPads and iPhones, though it's not um, developed for any other kind of device. So here's the reading program. You've heard of it. This is the app. So again, just go to the App Store, $2.99. This is the word builder where you're making families and putting things together. So there's the family, the ag, and then you put the W with it for wag. It's a great way to teach after logo reading. This is now matching the picture to the word. This is Edmark that really forces kids to read carefully. So she sits at the table. There will be another one that says she sits on the ball. So he has to match up to the right place, so he can't just guess that she sits or whatever. Again, matching by categories, using interests to teach reading, so phrases. Filling in the blanks. This is uh, Bob the Builder. Taking a sentence and doing what it says to do. Again, another way to just check out the comprehension. Another way to check out comprehension. Math is difficult because it's got sequential. 
Um, it's very sequential, which is, it goes totally against the way they learn. So you're going to have to do patterns. You're going to have to do something that looks like the whole thing. So he's stacking this up and filling it in. Here's some more um, really good math programs. I like Math Triumphs. This is on the next slide. So this is um, the equivalence board, which is over there that we, we had out earlier that we're selling. Um, it's a lot cheaper to bring it and not have to mail it. Um, math Triumphs I like because it's very, it, it's sequential, but it's also um, very visual and it really kind of, it, it makes math a lot more, it, it's easier to understand, let's put it that way. Touch Math you've seen before, the coenulators. Um, there's just a lot of different ones. Make it in no time is kind of a neat one. That's the, what this comes from. So you go online and it's just make it in no time. It's autismtasks.com and my secretaries will tell you you don't make it in no time. But anyway, um, so they do different ways to kind of put it all together. This is the math board. So again, five equals five and then you expand it. You can use um, actually objects and then you can use numerals. Uh, it teaches the um, the time and the money for you that wouldn't be helpful with the money but um, anyway these are the dots again another way with a penny board we did this um, to kind of teach rounding up so somebody could go to the store and buy something again angry birds we just do anything that we can get our hands on that the kids gonna pay attention to to be honest Here's another one of make it in no time. I'm gonna just slip through these really fast, but if you wanna see them later, we can. This is the one I told you where you read and then you put that many in the, same thing here. Put it into here. So you read and then you find what it is and put it in there and then you go back and check it. Um, kind of a neat way to, to check this through. This is another one where you use a language master and you just send it through and it will tell you um, what you need to make. This guy loved worms, so we just made worms out of Play-Doh. So he'd run it through the machine, which is right up here, and it was Grandpa's voice saying, make three worms. He loves his grandpa, and so he made three worms out of Play-Doh. That was a good way for us to kind of figure that all out. Okay, so I think we were going to talk a little bit about um, inclusion, but at this point I want to give our um, next speaker enough time to really share what she has to share. So I think we're okay if we cut it off here. Um, in Australia, do you normally include the kids most of the time? I know you have special schools. It kind of just depends on the kid, depends on where you live. Yeah, that kind of thing. Okay, because I know in New Zealand they do a lot of inclusion and most of their boys don't know how to read. I was pretty surprised. Same thing in Italy. So they include them all the time, which is great. And they have great social skills and their verbal skills are pretty good. but they don't have any academic skills because I think they don't have any targeted instruction. And that's kind of, I guess, we trade one for the other. Um, but I think, I mean, I know your boys, your girls can learn to read. <laughs> they can learn to write. Um, we do it all over the place. So I, I, it's not anything that's going on just strictly here or in um, New Zealand. So I think maybe we need a little of both, the targeted instruction and then allowing for some included uh, settings. So again, that's kind of what this was about. And you should have that in your handout so you can read about that. We just developed some ways to integrate the kids into the classroom without the para or the, the uh, teacher's aid just being attached at all times. That's just not inclusion. It's not geography. So you just put them in there and then you have a para beside them and they help with everything and the kid doesn't really integrate and the kid doesn't really learn much. So I think you can do both. And you can do that both of that both of those techniques very well. I'd like to explain sure. that because a couple of people have been Sure, let me do that. So this is the math board. And I just brought the basic kit because we knew with um, the money difference and those kinds of things it probably wasn't gonna be very helpful. So yeah, so you have two sides to this board. So one side is okay, yeah, let's do the other one first other side there we go so that's the equivalence part so basically it's saying on this side it has to match the other side so it could be a number two and a number two but it could also be because you get these little things in here um, soccer balls and what's the number or soccer balls and stars are the same so it's a, a whole bunch of different ways you can do that you can also use like I did the little cubes or something that's three-dimensional so that many equals the numeral okay so that's that part then on the other side you actually start equations 
So you're able to put out your numbers and then a plus, minus, um, and then we also have. Where, where does that go? So you've got a number here. This way. Yep. I'm not very <laughs> so a number here, then a plus or a minus, another number in the answer. It's a really nice way for them to do their math because they don't have to write anything. And that always gets them so upset because they really want to write, but they can't form the numerals. So again, on the other side, you've got this and then an equal sign and this. So they start to learn that a numeral stands for a certain amount. And that's for that side. And once they have that, then they can actually do operations. So that's, that's the math board. And it, it tells you all about it in the instructions right here. Okay. So that's 125 Australian. It's 100 in the States, but OK. So if you want it, um, I brought them because the uh, postage is just ridiculous to mail these out. And um, just look them over. And, and if you want one, let me know. And then we can get our transaction figured out. And then also the lectures. There are five lectures. So these are lecture series. Each one of those sells, if you do a DVD, they sell for $30 each. So the whole thing, five of them, I'm selling for 125 Australian. So again, that's a deduction for you. That's, that's quite a difference. And so some of those lectures are on these kinds of things that I've talked about, hands-on learning tools. We talk about the cognitive profile. That's in there. Uh, the girls, there's one full lecture on girls with Fragile X. Um, I'm forgetting the other ones, cognitive learning environment, and is there a behavior one? Anyway, there's five. So, oh, so the book really um, is pretty much everything that I ever knew about Fragile X. <laughs> and so you will see chapters on behavior, you will see chapters on adults and adolescents, you will see chapters on early development, on females, uh, a number of things, strategies for teaching. So. Yeah, I, I don't know how many pages it is, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a paperback, it's fairly decent size. It's like a big size paperback. Yeah, you guys still publish it here. Can you ma imagine that? Thanks to Jonathan. Yeah, so you have access. When I need to sell it in the States, I have to get it from you. <laughs> What's wrong with this picture? This is why makes so much money, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> What's that? ebooks um, you know I do here's the thing if you go on my um, site you will see ebooks and it will be all the articles that I've published and it's a free download so just marshabraden.com and you'll see several ebooks on there some are on behavior some, and they're basically articles they've called them ebooks but they're articles that I wrote for the National not Foundation the same, yeah. right not the same as the actual book yeah I don't have that on an ebook but it will give you some information around anxiety, things that I've written for the National Foundation. Again, that's a free download. And then you also see my other products, too. OK? All right, guys. Thanks so much. Nobody has any questions. Oh, you're all so smart.